Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, which is titled Looking Inside, where we're going to talk about real-time x-ray microscopy for failure analysis. I'm Edward Norton, as my introductor just said. And on the first slide here, we have a half view of a cell phone just uh, shown in the x-ray machine. And we'll be using some examples from this type of device later. It's a, industry, it's a type of device that covers a lot of different industries because it's got both mechanical components, optical components, electromechanical components. And so there's a lot of things that go into something high-tech like this. But each of those little pieces do uh, provide a bit of importance to many other industries uh, as most high technology devices do these days. So let's begin. I'm just going to go through an overview here. Uh, we're going to cover the basics of real-time x-ray microscopy, and I'm just going to highlight some of its features. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the system you use to do this type of analysis, uh, which gives you some of the ideas of its capabilities and limitations. I'll talk about some of the particulars about individual samples that causes you to see contrast in an x-ray image, an example of which is shown on the right. I'll uh, give some examples of applications that may apply to a wide range of industries, but by it's going to be no means exhaustive. And then I'll go through some nice examples of types of problems that you can solve uh, doing failure analysis on uh, X-ray uh, real-time uh, microscopy. And I'll show you some nice videos. So. The basics of a real-time x-ray microscope really haven't changed much in a long time. It's really technology that has led to incremental improvements. Uh, basically, you start with an x-ray source, and what you're trying to do is create a point source, what's called a micro-focus spot, so that you have the highest resolution in your image possible. By having the x-rays come from a single point, in theory, then you have sharp edges in your images, and uh, the ray trace that basically you get from the point source gives you nice sharp edges in the image that appears on the detector. The source must produce a range of X-ray energies in order to work with a variety of materials, because sometimes you're looking at polymers, and it's very easy for X-rays to penetrate them, so you tend to work at lower X-ray energies. Whereas when you're trying to look at something heavier, like a metal, like looking at welds or castings, then you're going to need a much higher energy in order to see through those thicker, denser, heavier atomic number materials. And so we've got the point source casting a shadow through the sample onto the detector. In this case, it's a digital detector or a digital analog detector. But in the old days, of course, it was film, and everyone's experienced that, I think, when they go to the, the doctor. And the same basic principle is really the same as the very first x-ray images from more than 100 years ago, where by causing uh, a material to impede the x-ray path from the source to the detector or film, then basically you're going to get different amounts of exposure on either the film or the detection device. So really... Uh, the shadow casting principle is the same as the original work done a very long time ago. But what's really special that gives you the real-time part of the X-ray microscopy is the detector. Uh, you need to have a high refresh rate in order to have real-time viewing. And so you can have refresh rates ranging from anywhere from just several frames a second to hundreds of frames per second depending on the type of sample you're trying to look at or the type of motion you're trying to capture. You need to have very high sensitivity in order to look at very dim signals as they're penetrating through uh, some high-density materials. For instance, you may have a metal housing around some moving components you need to see. And so you need to have very high sensitivity on the detector in order to uh, make out what's going on inside of that device. And you need to have very high resolution because you have very, very small features and details that you're trying to look at in many cases. And so uh, you want to have very high resolution on the detector. And, of course, that carries through from the source as well because if you don't have a, a small point source, you're going to get blurriness on the detector anyway. So you kind of need to have all parts of the system pulling in the same direction together. 
the X-ray source in a modern micro-focus uh, X-ray source works a lot like a scanning electron microscope where you have a filament uh, source that sends a beam down a column where you have lenses which focus the beam to a point and you have coils which take out stigmation and help focus it down to the smallest point possible on what we call the target. Now in this case the electron beam never actually leaves the electron source or the gun uh, because you're not trying to generate an electron beam for analysis, you're trying to generate an x-ray beam. So what happens is the electron beam is focused on the target in as small a spot as possible. Uh, you want to get a small spot to get the best resolution but there are limits to how small a spot you can get with how much energy uh, in terms of acceleration potential and how much current uh, or else you're going to burn up your target. So there are limits to just how small a focus you can get. A micro focus system is uh, spec'd out to have a spot size of less than 50 microns. Uh, and then basically you want to minimize damage to the target or else you'll, you'll ruin your x-ray source. Of course, once the atoms in the target get excited by that electron beam with that very, very fine point source, uh, they get excited uh, and produce x-rays as a result of both Bremsstrahlung, which is breaking radiation, which is uh, scattering of the electrons uh, as they pass through the material of the target, and then you also get absorption of those electrons by the atoms in the target and you get emission of characteristic x-rays. And so a lot of this is actually very much like what occurs in the SEM-EDS where you're trying to analyze a material using an electron beam, uh, except in this case we don't want those x-rays for elemental analysis, we want them to come out of the bottom of the gun and produce our image for us. And the target alloy is spe specifically chosen to provide a, a range of x-ray energies. So they have a lot of different elements in these targets. Uh, some high atomic numbers, some low, so that when you change the energy of the source beam uh, from you know, a few tens of kilovolts all the way up to several hundreds in some cases, or thousands in, in really high energy systems, uh, you get a, a beam of uh, x-rays, uh, or rather a, an emission of x-rays that covers a range of energies you need for your analysis. The detector converts the x-ray shadow, which would be hitting, this is kind of sideways from the way it is in the instrument I showed on the last page, because the x-rays are now coming in from the left, but basically this converts the x-ray shadow or image to a digital signal. And there's multiple types of detectors. The image intensifier is the older, well-known style that uh, basically is better at low dose imaging. So when you do have a lot of material in the way and not many x-rays are getting through, it's going to be better at higher refresh rates. Now, digital flat panels have come a long way in the last decade or so since they were introduced, uh, and they have great sensitivity, they have great resolution, uh, but in many cases they do suffer from lower refresh rates and tend to require a higher x-ray dose. And so for real-time x-ray, in many cases the image intensifier is preferred, but uh, I'm not saying it's impossible to do it with a digital flat panel. I'm just saying uh, each type has its strengths and weaknesses. So in this image intensifier, which is the detector we have on our system, uh, you have a scintillator that first converts the x-rays where they enter the front of it uh, to visible light photons, and then there's a photocathode layer that converts the, lights, uh, the light photons to electrons and accelerates them down towards this phosphor screen and by concentrating them down and accelerating, you increase the intensity of the output light that's produced when they excite the phosphor window. Uh, and then, of course, the image that's produced on the uh, phosphor is just captured by a standard uh, digital video camera. Uh, so this system is very complicated and has a lot of different components to it. Uh, and one thing that limits the resolution of the image intensifier uh, is the grain size of the materials that are present in all of these different layers, the scintillator, the photocathode, and the phosphor. Uh, digital flat panels, of course, are limited by the resolution of their own sensor size, and so you know, both of them do have limitations. So let's talk about the 
what makes the sample produce the image on the x-ray detector and, and how we can control that contrast. So the shadow that's cast on uh, the detector by the sample uh, depends on several things. It depends on how thick the sample is. And the, it makes perfect common sense to people that the thicker the layer of material that you have in the way, you're going to have a greater absorption of the x-rays that are passing through it, and therefore fewer of them will reach the detector. Uh, another factor is the type of material, of course. Uh, some materials absorb x-rays more than others. In fact, higher density or higher atomic number materials tend to absorb uh, x-rays at a much greater rate. And so, depending on the thickness of that material, you may get no x-rays through uh, a high atomic number of material of a certain thickness for a given uh, x-ray energy. And so, the last factor is, of course, the x-ray energy because all uh, three of these things combine together to give you the image contrast you get on the screen. And all of this is governed by what's called the linear attenuation coefficient, which is a property of a specific material. And it's dependent on each material. And it also varies as a function of x-ray energy. And that kind of goes to what I just spoke to in the first bullet, where uh, as you uh, change materials or x-ray energy, you get more or less penetration of the x-rays through the sample to produce the image. So the linear attenuation coefficient describes how much intensity you lose per unit thickness. But when you think about the x-rays passing through a thick substance, you have to integrate up all of those losses as a function of distance. And so even though it's a linear attenuation coefficient, the actual intensity versus thickness relationship is an exponential decay as illustrated by this equation here where you have the uh, thickness of the material and the linear attenuation coefficient in the uh, negative exponential here. And you can see how the intensity, uh, initial intensity, you know, drops exponentially uh, with distance. And so in the plot above that, if we have a low uh, linear attenuation coefficient material, you can see that we have a lot more x-rays that pass through per unit distance, which is the x-axis, compared to a high linear attenuation coefficient material. And so that will give you one sense of contrast if you have two different materials. Uh, this also, this relationship also governs how the effect of x-ray energy uh, occurs when you're imaging because when you change the x-ray energy, you're changing the attenuation coefficient for one specific material. So if you're looking at a piece of plastic at high accelerating potential, for instance, it's going to have a lower coefficient, so you'll get a lot of x-rays through, uh, whereas if you want to get better contrast on that low atomic material, you lower the x-ray energy and it ends up having an effectively higher attenuation coefficient. So there's a lot of interplay between x-ray energy, the types of materials you're looking at, and the thickness. Uh, just a side note, uh, sometimes when you're looking at those low atomic number materials that have very little contrast in them, uh, you can introduce a contrast medium, which would be a liquid typically, that has some high atomic number elements in it. So you can infiltrate, say, cracks or pores and see where the, the, the fluid has infiltrated your low atomic number uh, material so that even though the contrast of those features themselves would be very poor, you can actually see them quite well once they've been infiltrated with that contrast medium. And uh, that does have some very significant applications. Uh, magnification is obviously a key thing if you're talking about x-ray microscopy. And uh, if you're using, uh, when you think about when you go to the doctor's office and you're basically laying on top of the film, there's essentially no magnification and it's a one-to-one -one representation of uh, your uh, x-ray of your body, for instance. So in the x-ray microscope, we actually can control the sample to detector distance, and that gives us a certain amount of magnification based on how close the sample is to the detector. So there is an in-situ manipulator that allows you to move the sample up and down and also tilt and rotate and translate x and y so that you can control the viewing angle and you can control the geometry in order to get the desired magnification. And for most things, you generally want high magnification for the types of things that we're looking at 
using uh, real-time x-ray microscopy, but in some cases you just want a, a, an overview shot showing the entire device like I had on my opening slide of that cell phone, which is just a low mag overview. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, it, it may seem like an obvious uh, comment, but uh, x-ray microscopy is a transmission imaging technique, so it's not like you have a depth of field where you can select a particular imaging plane. You basically see everything that's between the source and the detector. So if you have very complicated structures, it can be very challenging to see the layer of interest. It may involve a lot of tilting and rotating, and that's one of the advantages of the real-time imaging, that you can really select the proper viewing angle for every sample. And sometimes fractions of a degree are required to really go from a, a, an image that shows you what you need to see in order to understand a failure to not being able to see anything at all. And so that's where real-time versus static uh, x-ray really has its uh, big advantages. This is a, a list of applications. They can be used for both failure analysis, which is kind of what I'm focusing on here, but also just routine quality control. And in fact, some industries are absolutely required to do uh, a high percentage of x-ray inspection on components before they are delivered to their customers. Uh, there's a lot of uh, mill specs that require uh, a certain high uh, amount of x-ray inspection before parts can be delivered. Uh, and so, for instance, the first application I've listed is military and aerospace. Of course, they have uh, critical safety features that are important to keeping people alive, and so they have a very, very high burden for uh, test and inspection of all types, and radiography is part of that. Uh, you can use it to look at electromechanical or electro-pneumatic devices. Uh, whenever you have moving components, uh, that it's tough to see inside how they work or why they fail, of course. You can look at castings and moldings, uh, both low atomic number and high atomic number materials to look for voids and cracks and other types of failures uh, that may have occurred during the casting or molding process. You can look at welded, brazed, and soldered joints for material distribution, for cracks, uh, and improperly distributed uh, solder. In microelectronics, you look at things like uh, wire bond uh, placement and structure. You look for the placement of devices in hybrid packages. Medical devices, of course, covers a very, very broad range of topics. Uh, you can look at something uh, from a very, very complex wearable medical device, and you can actually operate it and see how it works in the real-time x-ray. Or you can be simply looking at sealed uh, uh, sterile packaging and trying to see if a particular component was actually added to a, a package uh, in the proper way uh, rather than have to open up all the packaging and re-sterilize it after the fact. Uh, you can use it for all sorts of consumer products and electronics, like for instance the uh, cell phone that I showed earlier, uh, and of course it's used in litigation support for uh, many types of failures that may have led to property loss. So many of these applications have industry-specific standards which are applied to these types of analysis, uh, analyses, for instance, uh, ASTM, MIL, there's uh, many others, of course. For instance, medical devices uh, for surgical use are uh, measured by ASTM 640. And for those, you're trying to measure how opaque those devices are uh, when they would be placed in the human body to make sure that a surgeon using them with a fluoroscope would be able to actually see them when they're using them so they can properly place devices inside the human body. I'm going to start with a very light example of a wristwatch, my wristwatch in fact. Um, as a combination analog and digital uh, component, it provides several interesting features for examination. Of course, we have these push buttons here that operate these switches. We have the mechanism of the analog watch itself. Uh, we can examine solder joints for the electrical components and look inside this component here, for instance, which is the quartz crystal that drives the timer for the, for the device. Uh, one thing to note is that these are all negative x-rays where denser materials appear dark, and that's kind of the opposite of your traditional film-based x-ray where, say for instance, the bone that you see in your leg x-ray is going to be a white bone because it was blocking x-rays from exposing the film. Of course, you can run them in either mo the, the 
digital instrument in either mode, but the typical way for industrial x-ray is to show heavier atomic number materials as dark as opposed to the other way around. So I'm just going to go to a quick video here. And this is just a short little video showing the mechanism of the minute hand and some of the small gears. And this is, there's no real failure here in this first video example. It's just to kind of get your eyes calibrated um, to show you the workings of the, uh, the gears and just see the fine level of detail you can get on these very, very small components and uh, just the types of things that you can interact with uh, in the in this in the x-ray microscope although there wasn't a failure in that video I showed you there is actually a failure in this wristwatch uh, I don't know if anyone caught it in the moment I let you see the picture but this push button on the left here uh, is designed to push this contact against this part of the printed circuit board to complete the circuit you can actually see that on the one on the right that paddle has been bent out of the way during assembly and so this button never actually functioned uh, once it uh, was put together. So there, there was actually a failure analysis hidden in my light example. But let's go on to something a little more serious. Here we have uh, what I'm going to call a tension device where you have a flat spiral spring and this device uh, is basically uh, has a hub around it and as the hub rotates you increase the tension on the spring and by having a cable on that hub it's designed to place tension on a power cable on a robotic handler and so it's, the design is to keep the cable out of the way of the mechanism so that it doesn't get uh, tangled up and lead to an unsafe condition for the operators or the machinery. Uh, the failure of uh, the tension mechanism that I'm going to show you allowed the power cable to become tangled and uh, of course that was very bad for both the piece of equipment and anyone that was nearby. So let's compare a video of a defective unit and a working unit. So here's the good unit and for a flat spring we need to have good anchorage of the center of the spring to prevent its rotation and of course on the outside it needs to be well connected to the hub which we can see that it is as all the parts are moving around just fine and we can see the tension increasing on the spring as it uh, is spun uh, tighter and tighter around the central core here. In a moment we'll see the defective unit and we can see that it's not gathering any tension whatsoever. Uh, we can see that the central hub has been completely destroyed here and the spring is no longer anchored in the center so that it's not developing any tension whatsoever. You can actually see bits and pieces floating around in the background uh, of the components that have actually broken inside this. I'll actually rewind that a little bit so you can see that again. So you can see there's bits and pieces of the broken mechanism floating around in the background there, which uh, obviously was, you know, indications of what had actually broken. And granted, you could have uh, seen this type of uh, failure in a static x-ray, of course, uh, and you would have been able to see um, what this looked like if you just disassembled it. However, by watching the mechanism work, you can actually understand a little bit about maybe how it failed as opposed to just looking at the damage after the fact. And, and some of those pieces tumbling around interfering with the workings of the part may have actually led to a greater failure after the fact. I really like this next example. I think it looks really cool and so hopefully everyone else does too. So this is uh, an example of a thermal fuse. It plugs in on these lug, on these spade connectors here. And if we look at the x-ray inside, we can see there's a mechanism of the uh, fuse itself. Uh, this particular design is one-time use, on, uh, one use only. It's, it's not resettable, uh, but it, of course, being uh, connected easily with those uh, spade connectors, it is field replaceable, even though it's only uh, one-time use. Uh, we're going to compare units from a good working lot to units that were uh, causing issues with the equipment in which they were installed. And uh, during the x-ray, in addition to monitoring the visual appearance, uh, we can 
uh, we have a heater inside the x-ray machine that we use to increase the temperature of the unit at a controlled rate and we can also uh, use a data logger to measure temperature and electrical continuity through the device so we can see when uh, the, the device actually switches. So let's go to the video. So here we have the control unit. We can see the temperature is overlaid in the lower uh, left corner here. And so what we have is a shell of metal, of metal, which is connected to the lead coming in from the left. The lead coming in from the right is not actually connected to the outer shell uh, directly. It only has a connection through this plate here, which is touching the end of that lead. So as long as that's in contact with this connection here, we have continuity through the fuse. And this plate is uh, designed to be sprung by the spring on the right, and the spring on the left is what's uh, locking this plate in position. So, so now that you understand how it works, we can see how it operates. So here we'll speed up to 16x speed just to get through the ramp rate uh, a little more quickly, because of course in real time we do these analyses very slowly uh, in order to raise the temperature in a very controlled fashion. So, because uh, you don't want to overrun uh, the temperature uh, of the uh, of the unit you're trying to measure, you want a nice homogeneous temperature within the measurement region. So we can see the spring on the left is just starting to move, and of course, as it gets longer, as it expands, then of course its diameter decreases slightly enough to let it start to expand and right there you can see that it came off at right around 264 degrees Fahrenheit. And this was a nominal uh, 250 degrees uh, F fuse. So it was within about 10 percent of its design spec which was acceptable and so here we can see it in its sprung condition, and of course there's no way to reset this uh, externally. And here we'll just play it backwards and forwards just because it was really kind of fun to watch. That was just the same footage uh, played again just for your personal benefit. So here is the suspect unit. And uh, the outside uh, of the instrument, uh, the component rather, was aligned in the same way as the other one. Uh, but it turns out that when they install these things uh, internally, apparently there's no polarity issues because they installed this one going the other direction. Uh, we can see here that, again, the temperature is going up. And we're approaching 190 <coughs> degrees. And you can start the spring, see the spring on this one is starting to move already. And so this one actually loses continuity at around 210 degrees, about 50 degrees lower than the control unit. And that was the characteristic of the poorly designed units. Now, to complete the failure analysis, it was actually necessary to dissect these components and analyze the materials of those springs. Uh, to verify that uh, one of them was not using the correct alloy, which is why it didn't expand at the right time, uh, or right temperature rather, uh, which led to this bad batch of material. So again, here's just a static view uh, of just the before and after state. Uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a rather nice little design. And uh, it was very interesting to see it operate uh, and also see how the failures were still functional in that there was no physical obstructions that prevented them from, or caused them rather, to trip um, uh, early. There was no uh, material in, inside that was causing a, a failure of that type. They still operated fine. It was just a wrong material because of the wrong temperature. Uh, this here is one that's not a video-based representation because the real-time x-ray wasn't really used to record a moving component. Uh, what we had here was a sealed sterile transfusion kit, uh, which of course has several hypodermic needles inside. Uh, there was a concern that the wrong needle gauge was installed in uh, a whole lot uh, of these uh, packages, and rather than, again, open the packaging, uh, and replace all the needles manually, 
uh, it was decided that real-time x-ray would be used to inspect the packages for ones that were uh, potentially used or were using the wrong needle and those would be just culled from the lot so that the lot could be saved. So the real-time x-ray portion of it was uh, because you wanted to scan the packaging in order to find the needle and get a high magnification image of it, a high enough magnification where you could measure uh, the OD and ID uh, of, the, of the needle in order to make sure that it was the right gauge and wall thickness. And so this was actually done in a semi-automated semi fashion where it was done uh, using uh, in-house developed software where using the linear attenuation coefficients we could model this as two cylinders, uh, a, a cylinder with no material in it of course and a larger diameter uh, cylinder uh, with the linear attenuation coefficient of the metal and uh, from that you can actually have the software automatically extract the pixel intensity which gives you the grayscale values across the width of the image uh, through any particular region you desire. And then the software was able to run a model fit with that, modeling it again as two cylinders, uh, one with a low attenuation coefficient, one with a high, in order to use all of this thickness data in order to get a better uh, accurate measurement of the uh, OD of the tube. And so, again, there's no video for that because it's, it's a static image that we were using, but real time was needed to get the right image in order to do the analysis. Here we have a, another uh, thermal example because I, I think they're fun to watch. Uh, this one is a switch, not a fuse, and that this is based on a bimetallic element. And so it's self-resetting. Uh, once the temperature comes back down, so once it hits its cutoff temperature, it, it switches open a set of contacts, and then once the disk is allowed to uh, cup back the other way, it restores current flow at the lower temperature. So again, uh, we raise the temperature using the X-ray, uh, the in X-ray uh, heater feature, and we again use the data logger to monitor continuity and temperature to verify. Uh, when the switch switched. So just to take a look at the components of the thermal switch, uh, we have the housing that it uh, contains the unit. The top part is metal, the bottom part is plastic. Uh, up at the top here we can see the bimetallic disc and we can see it's cupped upwards in this place uh, on the upper right. Uh, we see that there's a mechanical linkage connecting the disc to the contacts and then, of course, we could see the contacts themselves. And these are, in the control unit, the contacts look good, uh, actually unused. There's no evidence of arcing or welding, which is one thing that you can actually see uh, quite clearly in, in many X-ray images of, of heavily damaged switches, uh, if that is the root cause of failure. So here we're going to watch thermal switch control unit. And again, we got the, the disk. We've got the linkage and we've got the contacts down at the bottom. So now we're going to speed up the video playback speed uh, even faster than before because this one is a nominal 350 degrees F switching temperature. And so we're going to see uh, how this actually does. And again, you can test this just on a bench and test its switching temperature, but if there's a problem, then you might not understand why there's a problem until you actually see. Now, this one just switched at around 345, so that's that's within a, a reasonable tolerance. And now we're going to watch the cool down cycle for when it switches to turn the current flow back on. So down at the bottom, we can see the contacts are currently open, and the disc at the top is cupped down. Now that we go back to slow down speed, we can see that we're going to watch the closing of this switch. And that'll be that for the control. So now we're going to watch a higher mag view. This is actually a composite of two videos. And we were trying to uh, see what the mechanism was of the failed unit. And again, this is sped up in time. We, of course, run these very slowly, typically, in order to make sure that you get accurate temperature measurements because the system is equilibrated. So here we're already over the 300 and 
50 degrees that the nominal switching value was. Here we're actually up at around 412 for the switching of this particular failed unit. And again, everything seems to be working just fine. There didn't seem to be any welding of the contacts, and the disc and the linkage all seemed to work fine. So uh, this particular failure, again, was a materials issue and not a mechanical issue in that the, the disc was not properly constructed of the right materials to switch at the right temperature. And so it was a bad lot of discs that led to this failure here. And so it switched both directions about 50 degrees higher. So this could have actually led to a potentially uh, unsafe condition due to fire because uh, of the excess temperature uh, the, uh, that was going to be inside the unit it was designed to control uh, before it was shutting off for safety, whereas the fuse uh, that we saw in the earlier example actually switched low, which wouldn't necessarily create an unsafe condition, but just might be problematic for running the device continuously uh, if it tripped frequently. Uh, this here is a, a more high-tech example uh, from a cell phone. This is, uh, again, the same one I showed earlier. We can see all sorts of things going on here. We have a camera. We have speakers. Uh, we have various buttons around the perimeter. We have the large area of the battery here. And, of course, we have the printed circuit boards with all the logic on them. But here we're going to be looking at the electromechanical components uh, because uh, they show some very interesting features. And so here we're going to be looking down at the bottom where we have the data power cable that plugs in. And it needs to lock in securely in order to guarantee adequate electrical contact. Uh, the mechanism of the fastening uh, was different uh, just by feel between the OEM, OEM and third-party cables. Uh, and by looking at the x-rays, we were able to find that the uh, third-party cables were not conforming to the specifications, uh, and we could see that they did not engage the cable lock properly. So here's the control unit. And as we see, right in those ellipses, there's those two clips coming in from the side here and here that engage these detents on the side of the power cable. And that's a very, very secure lock. So secure, in fact, that it almost overpowered uh, the actuator that we had available to test this uh, at the time, because you can see that once it actually releases, the plug really uh, was retracted very, very quickly because there was a lot of tension on the test actuator. And so you can see that that's very, very secure and the plug goes flying out of there. So on this one, which is the suspect, the third party, we can see that the cable is not able to go all the way in and securely engage these clamps from the side, which are inside the, the power plug. And so here, when we start to apply tension, it kind of more dribbles out as opposed to flying out uh, because this, this hold was much weaker than uh, what you could see uh, on the uh, control unit. And so uh, what it turns out is there was a piece of plastic, which of course doesn't show up well in the x-ray when you're trying to penetrate a bunch of metal in order to see what's going on inside the plug that was actually preventing uh, that cable from securely entering all the way into the socket. Uh, this here is another example uh, from a cell phone, but of course these types of uh, electromechanical or uh, electrical uh, connection issues come from a wide range of industries because, as I said, this is uh, just a high-tech example, but uh, this type of problem is applicable to many, many industries. So on, uh, in this example, one uh, lot of units was found to not have a functioning power button. And so we wanted to examine the mechanical and electrical components during actuation to determine uh, the cause of failure. And of course, as always, it's good to compare uh, known good units to, to problem units, which is what we did when we looked at that switch. So here we see this good switch. And as we actuate, we see that there's an internal dome switch, which is being compressed and then relaxing to its uncompressed state just fine. Uh, this is the actual external button, which penetrates through the walls of the case, which are on the left and the right down at the bottom. And 
as we watch that go, we can see that that works just fine. Now the bad one, we see that there's a problem already and that the dome switch is already completely compressed and when we try and actuate it, you actually don't see any motion in that button whatsoever. And if you look, let me just bring that video back a bit, you can see that there's a gap here on both sides where the button would normally be flush against the, the outside walls of the case. And so what the problem was here was the actual molding of this a button was incorrect and in that its dimensions were too large and so it would not actually uh, fit inside the hole in the case that it was designed to go into so that when it was installed it was obviously pre-compressing this uh, uh, dome switch uh, which was designed to actuate the power button. Well, that was my last example. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, this is my summary. Uh, obviously, I, I think real-time x-ray microscopy is invaluable for looking at failure analyses for many types of samples, even though I use primarily moving examples here because I think they're cool to watch. Uh, there's a lot of static examples as well that are, are invaluable to many industries. Uh, the ability to carefully line up a difficult shot, uh, as I mentioned, gives many advantages over traditional x-ray. Uh, even for static samples, of course, but also especially for moving uh, examples. And the ability to add thermal, electrical, and pneumatic, and temperature uh, inputs during testing really expands the range of problems uh, which can be solved. Uh, just to notice, in this webinar, uh, there's no client data or materials were used without permission, in case anyone was curious, because we take our customer security very importantly. And if you'd like a custom webinar, which we do, uh, for just for you and your company, uh, give us a call, because we can actually direct them specifically at your industry or your company, uh, working on your types of problems, uh, so that you can really see how our capabilities mesh in with uh, your needs. I'd like to advertise our upcoming webinars. Uh, the one that we have scheduled is on March 17th. Uh, 2017. It's the failure analysis of printed circuit boards. Uh, it's going to be uh, given by Joe Bedard, who is an expert in the field. And uh, we'll have more webinars upcoming in the in the fall uh, and in the summer as well. So please check our website for the next series after that. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll be happy to take your questions now. If you don't have a question that you want to ask right now, but you think of one, you can always send it to our answers at analyticalanswersinc.com email address. And if you'd like to see anything else about our capabilities, please feel free to visit our website as listed below. So uh, the first question that has come in is, um, uh, for litigation purposes, is there a, a standard for legality? Well, yes, of course, um, we always have to follow a chain of custody, and uh, many of the legal uh, litigation uh, cases that we run actually have members from both parties in addition to the custodian of the evidence present uh, to make sure that everybody uh, from both sides uh, is on the same page. And I'm scrolling through the questions here. Uh, can you view uh, glass fiber in an injection molded part? And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, there is enough contrast difference between the glass fibers uh, in the injection molded part. Uh, so that uh, you can see them. Sometimes it's a little complicated depending on the thickness of the material because if the fibers are going in a lot of different directions uh, in that same slice that you're looking through, uh, then it may be a little bit difficult to see. But if you had a very preferred direction uh, where fibers are all going in the same direction, which is generally considered bad in a molded part, uh, then that's certainly something that uh, you would be able to see.
the next question we have is, uh, can you see through a pumping control system and uh, determine how it is uh, producing a pulsation in the flow? Uh, the answer is yes, and that actually goes back to uh, a couple of things. Yes, uh, in order to see that, you would need to be able to introduce fluid uh, and power for the pump into the x-ray machine, so that's one thing. The other uh, interesting thing would be the uh, adding of a contrast medium to the fluid that you're pumping, uh, which is something I mentioned when I talked about image contrast. Uh, when you're thinking about a, how much contrast you get on a fluid, for instance, like water, and you actually get not that much because it's so uh, low an atomic number. So by introducing the contrast media, uh, we can improve the contrast of how the fluid uh, is flowing in uh, the unit that's of interest. And so it's it's beneficial to visualize the flow, but also look for uh, leaks uh, and uh, leak between, for instance, the lumens in a multi-lumen uh, tube. And so uh, that's how you can do that. Uh, actually, uh, what I when I uh, the the question is, uh, you said to get different energies, you use different targets. Um, I didn't quite mean it that way. I meant the targets have different elements in them to produce a broad range. Um, you don't often change targets uh, during uh, a client visit, which is the next question. So let's see. Oh, we're getting a whole bunch of other questions here. I hope we have time for all of them. Uh, how does real-time x-ray help to see what might have gone wrong in a uh, fire investigation? That's a very good question. Um, we've looked at many components that have been part of a, of a fire where uh, the uh, results of that fire basically have melted uh, many of the things uh, that were in the fire into a large plastic blob. And by looking inside of those, you can look to see what may have gone wrong in, in causing that problem, whether there was a frayed cord uh, that may have been uh, broken and led to a spark, or whether there's some other component that may have failed um, that's now hiding in this blob of plastic. It's also helpful to locate some of these things so that you can then excise them and do further analysis um, and uh, see what's going on. So, let's see, sample size constraints. Well, the, the maximum um, sample really depends on if you want to do just X and Y and Z translation or if you need to do tilt and rotate also. The tilt and rotate uh, sample holder uh, is limited by the weight uh, of what it can hold, uh, typically to around a pound or so. Um, and uh, for the... Um, XYZ table, it's more like uh, 15 pounds. So if uh, you can just do top-down imaging with X and Y, then you can handle a much heavier sample. The, the largest size is uh, probably about 2 by 2 feet, uh, but the field of view you get is actually much smaller due to the magnification. So uh, the lowest magnification you can get on a large sample like that is probably only to see the, the middle 10% of it. Uh, simply due to the size of the sample being much larger than the actual size of the detector. And I think we're going to have to make the next question the last one. Uh, can we use your x-ray system to see a medical implant inside the body? Uh, I made kind of a reference to this earlier when I referenced ASTM uh, F640, where you're trying to uh, determine what the contrast is of medical impl medical implements um, against what they call a body mimic, where you have uh, a thickness of aluminum, which is considered to be, by, according to the standard, the equivalent of the radio opacity of a human body. And by looking at the sample against that type of material, then uh, you can actually estimate how it's going to look when, when it's actually being used in surgery. So uh, that, I think, will be our last question.
you so much, Ed, for this really insightful session. Again, I want to let everybody know that if you want to review this webinar, it's going to be uh, published on YouTube as well as on our website. You will also receive an email notifying you when it has been published. So if you want to share that with your colleagues or you yourself want to review it. And again, we invite you to join us again on March 17th for our first ever Friday Lunch and Learn webinar so that you can kick off your weekend and finish off your week with some learning, this time again on failure analysis of PCBs and other electrical components. If you have further questions that we didn't get a chance to address in this webinar or on another topic, please feel free to email us at any time at answers at analyticalanswersinc.com. Again, um, I'm Christina Inge. I want to thank you for joining us today at this webinar. Thank you again to Edward Norton, Technical Director for his wonderful insights, and we hope to see you again next month. Take care and have a wonderful rest of the week.